Welcome to Toyota Time with Timmy the Toolman and Sean. Sean couldn't be here today because he's doing something else for his mom. He's a good son. We have special guests with us today. We have Sage and his brother Steven. They're from the Sacramento area and since Sage is active on T4R.org and he's viewed a lot of our videos, he had a project that he thought we would be interested in and he was correct. We are interested. He wants to do a e-locker swap. He has a 99 third gen. He found an e-locker rear end for sale and what we're going to do today is we're going to swap that rear end onto his rig and then we're going to have to do all the wiring so the locker works when he pushes the button inside his cap. I'm going to turn it over to Sage and let him explain what he bought, the research he needed to do, and everything else pertinent to getting this job done. All right, so I'm Sage, I'm from Sacramento. I'm K-R-U-T-O-Y Diesel on T4R.org. So what we're doing here is I bought a complete third gen 4Runner e-locked axle. Third member's already in there, it's an e-locker. All I have to do is swap out the rear axle and I'm good to go. Other than the fact that the gears are 4.3 in the e-locker and the stock third gen 4Runner without e-locker has 4.10 gears. What do you do in this situation? There are two options that you have. The first cheaper option is what I ended up doing is getting a matching front differential with 4.3 gears. Where can you find that? You could find that on the exact same truck that you pulled the e-locker from because he will have matching gears or else his 4x4 wouldn't work and his front diff would have exploded. Or the more expensive option is you just get the e-locker with different gears than yours and you re-gear your front and rear diff to something higher like 4.88 gears or 5.29 gears. Now most people with 33 inch tires or 35 inch tires do 4.88 but I would recommend 5.29 if you have 35 inch tires. There is actually a third option. Third option is you can get a e-locked rear end from a first gen Tacoma. The first gen Tacoma has 4.11 gears which is just close enough to the 4.10 gears that I have that you could just swap it in. You don't even have to get a front differential. Issue with that is the rear taco has leaf spring suspension. So you'd have to cut off the brackets and weld on coil over brackets or convert your rear end to leaf spring. After we swap the rear axle, we're going to wire up the OEM switch, ECU and harness to make it work all together and play just like OEM. So my dash will light up and the switch will light up. So it's going to look like it just came from the factory. You just got done listening to Sage describe everything he bought to make this job happen. And we're gonna walk you through the whole process of getting his rear end in, the wiring done, and ultimately we're gonna be able to show that the locker does engage, the light goes on on the dash, showing you that the locker is engaged and the job will be done. There are other options available Say for instance you got the e-locker rear end but you didn't get the necessary plugs like Sage got from the guy he bought the rear end from. You can buy a pre-built wiring harness from a company called Low Range Off-Road and we'll put a link in the video description to that wiring harness. It's basically plug and play. You don't have to do any of the soldering or butt connecting that you would have to do if you just got the plugs like Sage got. Another option for this e-locker retrofit is you keep your original axle housing, you pull out your third member, and then you have to do some alteration to the rear end so the e-locker third member will fit in. It requires you to do some grinding out of one corner of the axle housing so the e-locker will fit in. It also requires you to drill some new bolt holes and tap those holes so you can properly affix that e-locker third member to the axle housing. Choosing that method is a little bit more involved because you actually have to figure out how much you have to grind out to make the e-locker fit. You gotta drill and tap holes. If you like to fabricate, maybe that's an option for you. Sage and I are both in agreement that the route he's choosing is probably the easiest and most cost effective because he was able to get the entire e-locker rear end from a guy and that guy also gave him the e-locker ECU and he cut off all the different connectors that Sage would need to wire it up to his rig. So that's probably the most cost effective option and probably somewhere in the middle of time investment. If you bought the low range pre-made wiring harness, that's gonna save you some time. If you're willing to do a little butt connecting or soldering, 
putting together that wiring harness is not that hard, especially because Sage was able to source that really good wiring schematic that we're gonna use in this video and that you can use too because we're gonna put a link in the video description of that wiring harness. If you are interested in that e-locker retrofit, fitting the e-locker into your current axle housing, we're gonna put a link in the video description to a write-up from a Toyota form that the guy did a really good job showing everything he had to do to make the e-locker fit into his current axle housing on his rig. This is also the opportune time to do some other work on your 4Runner while you have everything apart. Number one, Sage is not going to use the axles that came on the rear end that he bought. He's going to use the axles that were already on his rig. So we're going to pull those axles off of the original axle housing and then we're going to put those axles in the e-locker rear end. While you have those axles out, this might be the time to do the axle seals. This might be the time to renew the axle bearings. It's up to you. If you click on the link above, you can see how we go about doing the whole axle seal job on a third generation Toyota 4Runner. If you don't own a press and the special tools needed to do the axle work, you could always just pull the axles and bring them to a machine shop or an auto shop that knows what they're doing and use our video as a reference to make sure they do the job right. The rear axle seal job is a very common repair that is done wrong. Please pay attention to the video that we made on this repair. This has got to be the number one repair that is screwed up by paid mechanics, dealerships, and everybody under the sun. Another thing you can do while you have everything torn apart, you can do the rear upper control arm bushings and you can do the rear lower control arm bushings. We have videos for that as well. If you click on the links above, we'll show you how to replace those bushings with some white line polyurethane bushings. This is also the time to renew your rear sway bar bushings. It's a pretty simple procedure. Buy either OEM rubber bushings or buy aftermark polyurethane bushings and replace the bushings for the sway bar and for the end links while you have everything apart. This could also be the opportune time to replace the rear brake line that goes to your rear differential with a longer steel braided brake line if you didn't already do it when you did your suspension lift. This also could be the opportune time to replace your rear shocks. It could also be the opportune time to replace your rear springs. So depending on what you've already done to your rig, you can be doing a lot of different things at the same time you're doing this e-locker retrofit. With all that said, let's get going on this e-locker swap. All right, Sage and his brother Steven are gonna remove this heavy axle housing out of his rig. Be sure to protect your back. Don't lift with your back, lift with your legs and use good body mechanics. They're gonna set it on a couple jack stands. So how heavy do you think that is, Sage? If you have the drum still on, it's heavy. <laughs> so yeah, you have the axles and the drums out. So those axles I've lifted tons of times and they are pretty heavy. So here's how we have the vehicle set up in my garage. The frame is being supported on both driver side and passenger side frame rails with six ton jack stands. And then we have the rear end supported by three ton jack stands. So when we get ready to drop it, it's supported. It's not gonna drop down to the ground on us. We have one of the front tires chalked fore and aft because we have the rear end off the ground. The parking brake is doing nothing for us right now. So definitely chalk one of your front tires fore and aft. The first thing we're gonna do is get the rear tires off the rig. Now that we have the wheels off, the first thing we're gonna do is disconnect the brake lines on the back of the backing plates. Sage is gonna use one of my gear wrench flex head flare nut wrenches to break it loose. To reduce the amount of brake fluid loss, Sage is gonna put a 7 seconds vacuum cap over the flared end of the tubing to stop the flow of brake fluid. And there you go. With that vacuum cap on there, now you don't have to worry about draining a bunch of brake fluid out of your lines. 
Now that we have the brake lines disconnected from the backs of the wheel cylinders, we're gonna disconnect the parking brake from the bell crank on each side. He's gotta remove a little pin and then slide the rod out of there to disconnect the brake cable. The clip is out of the way, now he's gotta push the pin through. They might be a little stuck, you might have to tap on them a little bit. There we go, the pin's out. And we're gonna do the same on the other side. The next step is we're gonna disconnect all the brake brackets from the differential. They're all 12 millimeter bolts. You can see where they're all connected. There's one here, there's one there, there's one on the opposite side. We're gonna get the brake hard line disconnected from the differential at all its attachment points. We got dual wrenching going on, so it quickens the pace. The brake line's free, now he's disconnecting the parking brake from the differential right there. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get the ABS wire disconnected from all the different spots. It has little clips that hold it into the bracket for the upper control arm. It clips in there where his finger is. You wanna disconnect the cable from all the attachment points to the differential. And then we also have to disconnect it at the end of the axle tube. We have to remove the 10 millimeter bolt and pull the sensor out. So Steven's removing the 10 millimeter bolt on the driver's side so he can pull the sensor out. You can see the style of clip that holds the ABS sensor to the differential. You have to compress the sides either with a screwdriver or needle nose pliers to get it out so now the ABS sensor wire is free. Steven already has the 10 millimeter bolt out for the ABS sensor and now he's got to pry it loose to get the sensor out. There's actually a little slot that he can get the screwdriver between the housing and the sensor to be able to pry it out. So that's a good technique. You can see the little indentation that allows him to get the screwdriver between the sensor and the housing. Sage is now removing the bracket that holds the parking brake cable right to the differential pumpkin. They're pushing the brake cable up and out of the way so when we get ready to drop the rear end, it's not gonna hang us up. They're just stuffing it on top of this frame member up above. Steven's now gonna disconnect the pan hard bar on the axle side. He's gonna use the impact gun with a 17 millimeter impact socket. We're gonna go ahead and remove the bolt on the passenger side too because we think the pan hard bar just gonna kinda get in our way. So we're gonna remove it entirely out of our way. <laughs> <laughs> and when the bolt goes flying, you know you're successful. He's having a little bit of difficult time getting that bolt loose on the driver's side, so he's just going to take a brass hammer and tap it out. There we go. That sucker's out. Now I get the pan hard bar out of our way completely. Boom. Pan hard bar's up. Sage did the rear differential breather mod. He ran the breather up into the gas fill hatch, just like I did on my 2000. Steven's just gonna undo the hose clamp and disconnect the breather hose from the union on top of the differential. So if you find that the hose is fighting you a little bit, using a little pick tool helps break the rubber hose free from the union, and then you can get it off easier. It's coming. It's coming. The breather hose is disconnected. We're now gonna disconnect the rear sway bar from the differential at the brackets on either side. So there's two 12 millimeter bolts. We're gonna remove those, then be able to get the sway bar free of the axle. He's got the bracket free on the driver's side and we're gonna do the same with the passenger side. The way the bracket's made, they have little hooks that go on the underside of the bracket. So to get the sway bar disconnected, we just have to tap the bar downward to free the hooks. Now before we get too far disconnecting things on the rear differential, we're gonna wanna get this rear drive shaft disconnected. We're gonna break free all the 14 millimeter bolts and nuts that hold the drive shaft onto the third member. And then we're just gonna tie it up up above with some bailing wire to get it out of our way. Sage utilizing a long 14 millimeter box and wrench on the backside on the nut 
Then he's getting on the bolt head with my little DeWalt impact gun with a 14 millimeter impact socket and a short extension. It's best to keep the transmission in neutral so you can spin the drive shaft. You can get the bolt in a position where you can easily get on it with the gun and with your box and wrench. So before you pull your last bolt out, you want to have some bailing wire ready to go so the thing doesn't drop down onto you or onto the ground. We're going to get a piece of bailing wire, wrap it around the drive shaft and pull it up above so it's out of our way. Now that he's got it supported, he could take that last bolt out. It might just break free from the flange of the differential. He also might have to actually hit it with a mallet to encourage it to break free. There it is. Now the rear drive shaft is disconnected from the differential. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna drain the differential. Steve is gonna break free the fill plug first and then we're gonna get the drain plug loose. Good. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get the axles out. The axle is held on with four 14 millimeter nuts on the back side, two on the top and then two on the bottom. Use your tool of choice. You can use a ratchet with a socket. You can use a box and wrench. Just get the 14 millimeter nuts off so you can pull the axle out. The one nut that is near the lower shock bracket, that one's hard to get a socket onto. So I would suggest using a long 14 millimeter box in to break this one free. Now with all four 14 millimeter nuts off, Sage can pull this axle out of the axle housing. Be very careful when you're pulling it out. You want to pull it out straight so you don't bend your oil seal if you plan to keep it. We recommend you change it. Tim has a video on that. And there's the axle out. We're going to do the same with the other side. It's Steven's turn. So now both axles are out. The next thing we're gonna disconnect is the lower shock bolts from the axle housing. It's a 17 millimeter. The shocks are fighting us a little bit, sliding off the post of the mount. We're gonna now work on getting the upper control arms loosened from the axle housing. And then maybe later we can twist the differential just a little bit to get a straighter shot, sliding the shock off of the mount. Sage is using my impact gun with a 17 millimeter socket and he's going to zip the nut off. Now he's going to go for the other side. He's going to tap the bolts out with the mallet. He's just going to use a screwdriver to help tap the bolt out the rest of the way. Using some ratchet straps and figuring out which way to pull the rear end to get the bolts out easier is one technique we could have used, but we just decided to knock it out with the screwdriver and it worked. So now that upper control arm is disconnected from the differential housing. And the other side is disconnected now. Now Sage is going to disconnect the lower control arm from the axle housing. Sage is using the impact gun on the bolt and Steven's holding the nut with a long box in. Before we disconnect the other lower control arm, we moved our jack stand. So we have a six ton jack stand on either side, right under the end of the axle housing. And then we have a third jack stand going to be supporting the third member. So as soon as we disconnect that, we don't want all the strain on the shocks. The differential is gonna to wanna to rotate on us with all the weight of this. So this is gonna help support the weight when we disconnect that last lower control arm. So those of you out there in YouTube land, it's probably good that we didn't show you what happened when we were finally able to pry the lower shocks off of the mount because things kinda of happened quickly. And luckily Sage and Steven were on both sides Things kind of went flying, the springs dropped out, the 
pumpkin rotated. We had the jack that was there kind of came out from supporting it, but nobody got hurt. Did you get hurt, Sage? I'm good. <laughs> Steven, you're okay? I'm All right. Good. And I'm okay because I wasn't one of the ones on the ends. I was dumb. <laughs> or, or I was doing the prying on the shocks. So lesson learned, definitely get the shocks disconnected first. It was just fighting us. We were worried that we were going to damage the shocks by prying on them so hard, but we finally got them off the lower mounts. The other option would have been to disconnect them from the top, but knowing how difficult it is to get the upper mounts disconnected because it's in that dished out area, we decided to get it disconnected from the lower mount. Anyways, it's released from the vehicle. So what Sage and Steve are going to do now is they're just going to start sliding the jack on the garage floor to where they can have an easier time lifting up the axle housing. So now that they have it in a position where they could properly lift using their legs, not their back, they're going to, well, <laughs> the good technique, Sage. Okay, so they're going to lift it up and just set it aside. Nicely done. So here's a good shot of all the things that we had to disconnect to get the rear end out. We've got the upper control arms. We got the sway bar. We got the shock absorbers and the lower control arms. We got the brake bracket. We got the ABS sensors. We got the parking brake. We've got the rear drive shaft. We got the breather hose from his extended breather mod. Also the pan hard bar. We removed the pan hard bar, got that out of our way. If we had to do this again, let me reiterate that it would be better to pry on these lower shock mounts to get them slid off of the posts and not do this as the last step. Because we did this as the last step, the rear end came down kind of uncontrolled when we pried the final side loose. Get the rear shocks disconnected earlier and don't make that one of the last steps. You want a jack supporting the third member and you want a jack on either side supporting the rear end. So when you do release the last thing holding it, whether it's a control arm or whatever you choose as the last thing to remove, it's not gonna go flying on you. This jack that was holding the third member slipped down and then the whole thing rotated and it came down a little bit uncontrolled, which could happen to you too and then the springs just kind of dropped out because gravity you know Newton Sir Isaac Newton here's the e-locker housing this is actually the actuator for the e-locker we're now ready to get the e-locker rear end into position so Sage and Steve are gonna pick it up again using your legs not your back they're gonna lift it up on the very ends, right by the hubs. Right by the hubs, yeah. There you go. So just like taking it out, we're supporting the axle housing on the very ends. Now they're gonna slide it underneath the rig. They're grabbing the control arm mounts and Twisting the differential to get the other jack stand underneath the yeah. third member. Careful. Let's get a roll off. Okay, let's get right there. So now the rear end is being supported on each end and underneath the third member. We're going to backtrack and kind of put things together as we took them apart. So one of the last things we disconnected was the upper and lower control arms. So we're going to try to get the lower control arms lined up with the bracket and the bolts in. To make it easier to move the control arms, we're going to go ahead and loosen the other side of the control arms so there's no tension on the bushing and it's easier to move the arm. <laughs> Tagged the fucking camera. Did it? Yeah. Nice. So Sage and Steve are working together and they're sliding the axles forward to where they can get the lower control arm bolt lined up. And then you got it all the way in. Okay, good. Now on both sides, we got the rear bolts for the lower control arms connected. We're going to do the same for the upper control arms. We're going to loosen the front mounting bolts so we can get a little bit of easier movement out of the arm. There we go. Take tension off of it. 
We're going to do the same with the other side. Now Sage and Steve are going to work on getting the upper control arm lined up with the differential. So what we did is we just used this as a kind of a fulcrum. We pulled the rear end, tilted it back to where we can get the bolt holes lined up on either side. It wasn't that hard because all the weight is being supported by the jack stands. They're pivoting on the jack stand. So you just, just pull on the bracket, pull it towards you, and then you can get the bolt holes lined up. Now we have both upper and lower control arms holding the differential in place. We jacked up underneath the third member with a hydraulic floor jack and now we're going to lower it down a little bit and our next thing we want to do is we want to flex the rear end on either side to get the coil springs back in position. So Sage is working on getting the coil spring on the passenger side. There we go. So Steve was kind of helping on this side. He was pulling up on the rear end on this side while Sage was pushing down on this side to get the coil spring up into position. We want the end of the coil spring against the stop on the mount here. And that's the appropriate way to put it in. The end of the coil is against the little stop right here. Now Steve is going to work on getting the coil spring in on the driver's side. Get that against tank on this side. There we go. If only all brothers could get along this well and work together. These guys are a pretty good team. Coil springs are in. To facilitate sliding the shock onto the lower mount, we're just lubricating it with a little bit of silicone grease. This will definitely help the rubber bushings slide onto the post easier. Next, we're going to use a plastic mallet and tap it in the rest of the way. We got the shocks connected to the lower mount. Because of the angle, the bushings kind of fight you. If you tap on it with a rubber mallet, you could get it slid on far enough. Then when you get this outer washer and the bolt on, when you tighten it up, it pushes the bushing in all the way if it actually came out a little bit as you were knocking it in. So now we have the shocks connected on both sides. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get the sway bar reconnected to the differential housing. So they're just getting the sway bar brackets back in place and they're going to bolt the sway bar back to the rear end. You have those little hooks that have to capture the bracket so those have to slide underneath. We got the sway bar connected on both sides with the 12 millimeter nuts. I'm now seeing the reason why Steve at Sonoran Steel makes the lift brackets for the rear sway bar because you can see how tightly the sway bar is coming on top of the actuator for the e-locker. We don't know exactly where the sway bar is gonna be sitting until we get the wheels on and put the weight of the truck on the wheels. The lift brackets that Snore and Steel sells is probably a good idea if you have an e-locker so it gets the sway bar further away from the e-locker actuator so when you're four wheeling, you're not gonna damage the e-locker. Now that we have the sway bar connected, we're gonna work on getting the ABS sensor wires connected up to all the little spots that the clips go into and then we're going to work on reattaching the brake hard line to the differential as well. So let me show you all the things we reattached so far. So we got the parking brake reconnected with the pin and the clip. We have the ABS sensor connected. We have the parking brake connected to this bracket. We have the ABS line connected there with the clip there with the clip. There's another one around the corner clipped into the side of that bracket. You have the parking brake connected there. You have the brake line connected there. Brake line connected down below. Parking brake connected there. You have the ABS clipped into that bracket. You have the ABS line connected down there. ABS line connected there. ABS sensor in there. Parking brake connected down there. We got the drive shaft reconnected. And we got his breather hose reconnected to the fitting on the top of the differential. So you can see Sage also has the Canar correction kits that that guy Keith sells. Now we're going to get the other side connected. 
if you find the second bolt you're trying to get lined up isn't really working, if you jack up underneath the third member a little bit, it will help you get the bolt holes lined up. So now we have both 17 millimeter bolts and nuts attaching the pan hard to the vehicle. We have everything bolted up for the rear end, the control arms, the pan hard bar, the rear drive shaft, but we don't have anything torqued to spec yet. We're just going to wait till we get the vehicle on its wheels and then we're going to go underneath and just be real careful to make sure we torque everything to spec. We're not going to show the torquing of everything because we really don't need to show that, but we're going to list all the related torque specs in the video description so you'll know all the related torque specs when you get around to tightening everything up yourselves. So now we're going to explain the wiring part of this modification. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Sage and he's going to explain how he's going to go about wiring this up. All right, so here we have the wiring schematic for a 98 Toyota 4Runner, but it, it should work for all the 4Runners. We're going to start here. This is the plug that's going to plug into your differential. So once you plug this in, it will go underneath your car, it'll go above your gas tank, and then into your cabin, and then we'll drive it all the way to the front end kick panel where the locker ECU and the switch will be. All these wires will be spliced in into the ECU pin and then the ECU pin will be plugged in and then further up here we're going to wire up the switch to the ECU plug as well back here because right now everything is cut up. I don't have it e-locked Forerunner. I bought everything separately so all I did is I purchased each of these plugs from the person who sold me the e-lockers all he did he just snipped it after the plug so i still have the plug all i gotta do is all wire it together i wanted to make it as oem as possible so here we have some additional things added on so the two middle wires wires three and four the red looking ones those are for the light for the switch light now our third gen foreigners the switch does not light up i don't know why toyota did it that way but that's the way it is if you had a tacoma locker the switch does light up stupid i know so here we're going to wire it up so it actually works how it's supposed to from the factory with a light. And it's going to be wired up to the fuse tap inside the kick panel uh, fuse box using a add a fuse, which you'll see later on in the video. And then here we're going to wire up the e-locker pin all the way up to the dash. So the dash will actually light up showing rear locker is on. So if you have a third gen 4 with an e-locker already in it, that will already happen. But the issue is, you don't have that wire if your third gen 4Runner didn't already have an e-locker. So you actually have to wire it to your dash at the back of the cluster using a repair terminal pin that you can buy from Toyota for like 5 bucks. The part number is here. This is the pin that will go into the back of the cluster. And then you'll buy two of these pins up here to plug into your switch at the back so you can light up the actual switch. In case you didn't see all the detail that you wanted in the video, We'll put a link in the video description of the digital copy of this electrical schematic so you can have it and you can analyze it as much as you want. Here is the plug that will plug into your e-locker. It'll have a male end on the other side it will plug in. And here you can see I bought the plug with the e-locker and it was cut right here. So I bought a six conductor trailer wire. So they typically use these six conductor trailer wires in trailers. You could buy it on eBay. It's a couple dollars a foot. I bought 15 feet. I believe it uses about 12 feet. So here I pretty much soldered the connections as much as I could to color so it'll be easier for me to find. So I matched the green with the red stripe to the red. I matched the fat green wire, solid green, with the green. I matched the green with black to the black. I matched the yellow with the green to the yellow and then I matched the thin solid green wire to the brown and then I matched the two white and black grounds I spliced them together and I matched them to the white on the trailer wire. If you're familiar with our fuel filter replacement video or the video we did of removing the gas tank to do a fuel sending unit replacement we're right now behind the driver's seat we have the passenger seat tilted up We've got the other seat tilted up in the back so we could pull the carpet up. We removed the cover that fits over the top of here. Then we took the 
female connector and we fed it through here on the top of the gas tank and then Steve was underneath and he was able to grab the female connector and then we're just gonna sandwich it right on this rubber grommet it's not perfect but when we push everything down it's probably going to seal just fine if you want to see more detail how we got the carpet up and everything you can click on the link above for the fuel filter video and you'll be able to see in greater detail how we lifted up the seat and got this cover off all right sage and i are underneath the rig here's the gas tank skid the back of the gas tank you can see the female plug hanging there and then the male plug is right there in Sage's hand. And he's got a bracket that he has to connect up. It holds the wire. The bracket we put in is right here. There's a 12 millimeter bolt that went in from the top and tightened down. So we just cinched it up with a little quarter inch ratchet. It doesn't have to be super tight because all it's holding is this light little bracket for the wiring. So Sage is now gonna put that little breather. It has a little clip on the end. We use my truck as a reference and it just clips onto the body right near the fill tube for the uh, fuel tank. You can see the black clip attached to the body right next to the fuel tank fill hose and the breather hose just goes into that little gap in the body for the e-locker actuator. The female male plug are connected up now and there's a metal tab that sticks off of that bracket and you slide the two plugs together onto that metal tab and it kind of locks in place. Now Sage is just zip tying the wiring to different attachment points to the metal fill pipe and wherever else he thinks is necessary. So it's up to you how well you want to zip tie it along its route. Sage wasn't too happy of how well that clip held the harness plugs together. So he just put a zip tie and pulled it against the bracket to where it's not going to be able to back off of that little mount. So we got this hatch back in place. What Sage did is he ran the wiring for the e-locker on the left side and this wire was initially over here so he just shoved it over to the middle, made room for this, put the Phillips head screws back in place and tighten them up. Now we're going to have to run this wiring on the driver's side so these trim pieces pull up everywhere there was a screw that's where there's an attachment point so you can get underneath there with a plastic trim removal kit tool or you can get underneath there just with your hands or a screwdriver and you pull them up we took this b pillar trim piece off also we took the trim piece off right near the driver door and we took this kick panel trim piece off also. If you need more information on how to remove these trim pieces, click on the link above. We show removing trim pieces in our body lift video. They just pop off. You get underneath it, pull outward, the clips release, and you're able to remove those trim pieces. It's not that difficult. So you can see the wire right here. It goes from underneath the seat through the hatch that you can get access to the top of the fuel pump. It travels this way towards the driver's side and we have it basically running along the side here in any of the existing clips that we can fit it into and towards the driver's seat. You can see the wire bundle right here. It's running along the driver's side here. He's got some additional wiring that's getting in the way for stereo speakers and subwoofers. Right here. Oh, there's the subwoofer right there. He likes gangster rap to rattle his whole truck to pieces. <laughs> <laughs> so then it's running here and it's gonna run to where the E-Lock or ECU is gonna be somewhere over there, isn't it? Yep. We now basically have the route of the wire bundle. Now Sage is gonna do a bunch of soldering to get everything connected. Here's where the E-Lock or ECU is gonna go. This is your fuse panel. You go below, this is the kick panel we removed. You go further back, and this is the e-locker ECU, and then we needed an M6 bolt, and so he bolted it right there. Now that we got the ECU box connected underneath the dash, Sage is working on wiring the plug that's going to connect up to the trailer wiring harness that we ran from the e-locker along the body and then towards the front so what he's doing now is he's soldering all the connections and then after he's done soldering the connections he'll give a good explanation of which wire goes where if you don't know how to solder i kind of give a couple quick tips but i recommend watching a couple youtube videos there are plenty of them out there on how to solder and the different types of connections that you may do so basically once you know which wire is going to go to which wire i have my two connections right here so my green wire off of this plug 
is going to this green wire off of my trailer wire as you saw earlier in the video. I'm going to put some heat shrink early on. I'm not going to shrink it yet, but I'm going to put it on because I won't be able to put it on later after I solder the connection. They cross into each other. So you get them to cross into each other and then you spin them and you try to wrap it tight. Basically, you want to make this connection already pretty tight on its own. It's holding to my satisfaction right now. I'm still going to solder it and you should solder it. You should not leave it as is and do not call it good like that. Next step is you take some of this little paste, put a little bit on your soldering gun, and then you take your soldering wire, you get your soldering gun a little bit hot, and you just tin the tip of it just a little bit. Okay, now that it's tinned, I'm going to start from the middle of the wire. I'm going to feed the soldering core from the middle out. As you can see, it's feeding in I'm going to do one side, then I'm going to do the other side. I feed from the middle because if you feed from the outside in, you're going to start seeing the wire insulation itself heat up a little bit, and that sucks. Pretty much want most of the connection soldered in. So that looks pretty good right there. And then I'm going to wait for it to cool off. I'm going to put the gun away. And then from here on, I'm going to slide this heat shrink over the connection and heat gun it until it shrinks over. The heat shrink I am using is marine grade heat shrink. It has a adhesive on the inside, so it adds water protection to it. You don't really need to have it because this part is going to be on the inside of the car, but I recommend using it anyways. You want your connections watertight regardless, so we'll do that soon. Sage likes to make electrical connections with soldering. You do have options. You could do what I've showed you in other videos where you use a buck connector. And the connectors I use are shrink buck connectors. You slide each end in, you crimp it, you use the heat gun, you shrink down the ends. And it's kind of a similar thing because with the shrink ends, it's going to make it totally waterproof. So that's another option. If you don't want to bother with soldering, I suggest using some shrink buck connectors. And that would require you to get a heat gun. So it might be a little bit more expensive than just using regular buck connectors, but that is an option. All right, so here we have the other side of the harness. Here in my hand is the trailer wire. This is what we ran from the differential locker itself, exactly. And we solder them and heat shrunk them exactly to the same connections, to the same colors that they were at the diff. So they go to the ECU and the wiring diagram will explain it pretty darn clear. Basically the way we had it from the diagram is the green with the red would go to the red trailer wire and would return to the same side on the diff. The solid green thicker one would go to the green and then go back to the solid green thick at the diff. This thin green one would go to the brown and would go back to a thin green one at the diff. The black and green would go to the black and go back to the black and green at the diff. This white one actually conjoins both the white from the diff and the white from the actual ECU and it'll actually go to ground at the end. So that's the first ground. This blue and red wire at the bottom of the ECU connector is a ground wire. This is what will disable the safety which only allows you to turn on the e-locker and four low. So with this wire grounded, the blue and the red coming from the ECU, you'll be able to turn on your e-locker in four low, four high, and two wheel. This green and orange wire, so the green and the orange, the, these down here, this color doesn't really matter because they're all gonna be grounds. This ground will actually disable the five mile an hour limit. Another way to do this is leave it as is, do not ground it. It should, in theory, keep your five mile an hour limit. So basically you won't be able to engage your locker unless you're going below five miles an hour. Once you engage it, you can go above five. You just can't engage it when you're above five. But once it's grounded, like mine will be, I can engage it at any time. So this could potentially be dangerous to your e-locker. If you're going above five miles an hour and you accidentally hit the switch, well, guess what? Your e-locker will try to engage at above five miles an hour. So do this at your own risk. Some people, what they have done is they put a switch in the middle of the wire and they basically switch it on or off. You know, just in case they let somebody else drive a car, they'll turn this feature off. So even if they hit it accidentally, it won't turn on. So these are my three grounds. Now we're going to start talking about the wires that go to the switch. So we'll start with this green and yellow wire at the top of the ECU. This goes to a yellow wire and then goes back to a green and yellow wire at the switch. 
this is will plug into your e-locker switch button so the green and yellow wire coming from the ECU will conjoin to the green and yellow wire on the R locker switch this bottom yellow and black wire will conjoin the black wire at the ECU and they're going to go to your fuse that's a tap of fuse you'll have the existing fuse that you're replacing and then this fuse for your current wire that you're adding you're going to take out the fuse from here add it to your add a fuse so you'll have two fuses in here and then you're going to put this one back in into your turn there's one more wire on the ecu we're going to talk about it last because we still have yet to plug it in there's two more wires left on the switch these two wires we have added your third gen forerunner switch won't come with it these are the two wires that will actually light up the switch when you turn it on so one of these goes to the ground as you can see here it's a ground wire it's the one nearest the green and yellow wire that's going to be your ground this next one will actually go to a fuse by itself and it will go to your gauge fuse. Same way to do it. You take the fuse out of the tent, put it in here. So now you have two tens in here. You put it into the gauge. Simple as that. So basically this add a fuse will still only limit that connector that you're adding it to. You see how this one has a 10? You're still only going to be allowed 10 amps through it. The thing is, if your gauge fuse blows, it'll blow most likely on the closer one. And then if your switch blows, this is wired to my switch, it'll blow the top fuse. Or vice versa. I'm not sure which. Either way, if you have a blown fuse, just replace it. So you can see the two TAPA fuses that Sage used to power the switch and the ECU. The last but not least, we left the yellow and blue wire that goes from the diff. The yellow and blue wire that goes from the diff transfers to the yellow solid wire in the trailer wire and then it connects back to the blue and yellow wire. Then it'll also connect to another yellow wire that I have ran through the top of the dash. So it'll be like three wires conjoined together. This pin I bought from the dealer and it's actually on the diagram, you'll see. It'll give you a repair wire with female terminal. It'll actually list the part number and it says for lighting RR diff lock indicator light doing the e-locker wiring so I can get the dash light to come on. So issue here is I wired this pin that comes from the switch and the ECU. I put it into the wrong switch at the back of my cluster. This is the leftmost side nearest the door. I put it into this switch at the most left side. It's actually supposed to go on the far right side into the brown switch, which I will show momentarily. There's brown switch which plugs in on the very far right side of the back of the cluster if you're looking at it head on. So if I'm looking at it head on to, at the very back side, right about here, plugged in, it's a brown switch on a Forerunner, at least on mine it is. I'm going to plug it in into pin number five. Pin number five is counting from the left. So you'll see one, two are filled, three is empty, four is filled, five is empty five being the one right here at the end of my thumbnail. We're going to fill this pin and feed it into pin number five here. So one, two, three, four, five into the empty one on the right side of this little clip. As you can see now, it is filled into pin number five, counting from the left, one, two, three, three is empty, four, and then five. Five is the one that I just put in, is this one here. The middle of my thumb it is that pink wire five is the one that you want to put in if you want your rr dash light to come on showing that your rear locker is on in regards to getting to the back of the gauge cluster we do have a video for changing a dash light bulb if you click on the link above you can see how you can tear apart the dash so you can get to the cluster and get to that electrical connection where he had to add that pin. You can see right here that all the grounds he needs for this project, he's gonna ground it to the body right here behind the kick panel. And this should complete all the wiring he needed to do for this project. We just finished the e-locker swap, full complete axle, got all the wiring hooked up, OEM switch, OEM ECU, and hopefully OEM lighting function once we test it out. What do you think, Tim? It's another repair that took all day. It's dark out, so that means it's past 9 o'clock. We started this job, what, about 9.30? Yep. Yeah, so <laughs> like usual, we knew this was going to be a long job, but now 
it's the moment of truth. Is a damn thing gonna work? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Did I solder it correctly? <laughs> he doesn't even have to put it in four load to get the e-locker to lock because he did that modification where he can lock it in two wheel drive, four high, whenever he wants. He could lock it up at 80 miles an hour if he wants to destroy his rear end. Okay, so we're gonna test this thing out. I'm going to show you guys my e-locker, how it's actually working. And there's my switch. My dash will light up once I engage it. I just wanted to point out here that I am in 2x4. I'm not in 4x4. I have the wire mod where you don't have to have it in 4 low to engage the e-locker. So I am in an H2. I'm in 2x4. And this is high 4. That's low 4. So I'm in 2x4 right now. Put in drive. See, 4x4 is not engaged. Hit the locker button. Light is blinking. There we go, it's engaged. Solid light, I can prove it. You'll hear the chirping of the tires. That's how you know, you'll hear incredible tension to your tires because both of your tires are spinning at the same time. So if you're turning, your inside wants to rotate less than your outside wheel. So one of your tires will start chirping. So now I'm going to turn it off. The light is still on. I'm gonna wait for it to disappear. There you go, done. Now, as you can tell, I'm gonna go in S turns and you won't hear that resistance from my rear tires anymore. That's it, baby. All right, we are done with this job. One thing that we didn't show you in the video is we had to bleed the brakes because we disconnected the brakes to pull the rear end out. So obviously we had to bleed the brakes. If you're unfamiliar with how to bleed the brakes, click on the link above. We have a video that will show you how to do that. I would have to say that this modification is fairly straightforward because it's not really difficult to pull the rear end out. It's just a lot of different things to disconnect. The one thing that I would be careful with is when you get the last thing that's holding the rear end securely to the vehicle, be ready for things to happen sort of quickly. So have a buddy or have two buddies helping you to where when you get that last thing disconnected, whether it's a control arm, whether it's a lower shock mount, whatever it is, that rear end's pretty heavy and the third member's got a lot of weight to it and it's gonna wanna pivot. And then the springs are gonna come crashing down if you haven't already removed them and whatever else that might come falling down that you haven't removed yet. So just be aware of that and just do things really methodically and carefully so you don't get yourself hurt because the damn thing weighs quite a bit. I thought the wiring was gonna be a little harder than it was, but with that electrical schematic that Sage was able to find online and then the explanation that Sage did during the video, it really made sense. And so I think most people could handle this even if they don't have experience with electrical. As long as you could use butt connectors or you know how to solder, you should be able to do the wiring necessary to get this job done. At the end of the day, this job was successful. His e-locker works. It engages. The lighting feature on the locker button worked for him. So now he has a button that lights up when he pushes it. And when he pushes the button on the dash, it will show that his rear end is locked. So everything that Sage wanted to accomplish with this modification worked. It was a success. With all that said, we thank you for watching Toyota Time with Timmy the Tool Man and Sean and special guest Sage and his brother Steven, whose parents originate from the Ukraine. So th these guys are now my Russian brothers, my Russian brothers. We're gonna drink some vodka. We will of course be back with more videos. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. If you have any questions or comments, do that below. Take care. Bye-bye. Because gravity, you know, Newton, Sir Isaac. Timmy.